invite you to turn in your copy of the scriptures this morning to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8 is coincidentally, providentially, on page 888 of that Bible that's underneath your seat. If you didn't make it to church with a Bible this morning, there's black Bibles in the rack of the seats in front of you. Grab that Bible, pull it out, turn it to page 888. Again, we're in Paul's letter to the Romans. They're right in the middle in chapter 8. Friends, if you're new here with us at Redeeming Grace Church, uh, what we're about to do this morning is the really the same thing we do each and every Sunday here at Redeeming Grace. I or another preacher stands up here in this pulpit. We take God's Word. We turn it to a, a particular passage in the, in the Scripture. Uh, I, we explain it, and we explain its meanings, and, and then seek to apply it to our lives. And usually we do this sequentially right through a book of the Bible, since that, that's how God has revealed His Word to us. Call this type of preaching expositional or expository preaching, preaching that seeks to expose God's Word on its own terms rather than on ours. For the past couple of spring semesters, we've been working our way steadily through Paul's letter to the Romans, and this morning we've again landed in Romans 8, which is right at the end of the second big section of Paul's letter. In Romans chapter 8, page 888. Friends, ever since the beginning of chapter 5, Paul's purpose has been to to draw our attention to all the benefits that are ours in the salvation that Christ has won for us. And now that we've reached chapter 8, it's like Paul parades these benefits by us one after one after one to assure us of the confidence and the security that we have in the love of God. Last week, we caught the beginning of that parade in verses 1 to 11. Envision yourself kind of watching the glorious truths of the gospel parade by. Chapter, in verse 1, it's like we said, oh, look at that. There's, there's no condemnation for us in Christ. Every last drop has been poured out on Jesus who took the condemning penalty of our sin in himself on the cross. Oh, not only that, look there, look there. What's coming next in the parade? In the very moment our eternal verdict of condemnation changed to righteous. We were changed from guilty to innocent. God, by His Spirit, transferred us to live in an entirely new kingdom or realm. We're no longer in the realm of the flesh, Paul writes. We're no longer living in the life of rebellion and sin against God. We're in the realm or the kingdom of the Spirit. And oh my goodness, that's not all. Here comes something else. It's not like the Spirit just kind of plucks us out of the kingdom of the flesh and airdrops us into the kingdom of the spirit, never to see us again, right? No, what he does is actually take up residence in each one of our lives if we're a believer in Jesus. He indwells us and empowers us to live a life honoring to God and actually becomes the agent of our bodily resurrection at the end of the age when Christ returns. Friends, I've got good news for you. The parade of God's grace continues in verses 12 to 17. These verses color in the lines a bit of what it looks like practically to live in this new kingdom or realm of the Spirit. So let's read together, starting in verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him, in order that we may be also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, it's not at all hard to see what Paul is doing in these verses, but I think the implications of what he's saying are just absolutely mind-blowing for us as Christians. In verses 12 and 13, Paul writes that because we as Christians have the Spirit of God, we're no longer obligated to respond to the demands of the flesh but instead to put our sin to death through the power of the Spirit. Becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, believe it or not, doesn't put us on a cruise ship headed to heaven, right? Where we kind of lounge out on the deck and be comfortable in our sin. No, Paul writes that becoming a follower of Christ puts us in a war with sin that we fight daily in the power of God the Holy Spirit. 
And then in verses 14 to 17, Paul arms us for this fight with a deeper knowledge of our new status as those led by the Spirit of God. And shockingly, what he tells us to arm us for the fight is not that we're soldiers in God's army or hired mercenary assassins against sin or anything like that. Instead, he calls us to put sin to death with the knowledge that we are beloved sons and daughters of God who has adopted us as his own. Friends, here's the main idea. Here's the main idea of the text that I pray will be the main idea of the sermon this morning. Big summary statement, the big takeaway from Romans 8, 12 to 17. Here's what the Christian life looks like. Sons and daughters of God waging fierce warfare against sin. And do you want a good summary, a good synopsis of what the Christian life looks like? Well, here it is. Sons and daughters of God, our King, waging fierce warfare against our sin. And we're going to look at this uh, this text, it kind of been the two parts that I see is the structure of the text. Number one in verses 12 to 13, our serious obligation. Serious obligation, not to the flesh, but to the spirit. Number two, our incredible privilege. Our incredible privilege as sons and daughters of God. Beloved, I pray that as we study this obligation and privilege together, that God by his spirit might use the word this morning to conform us more fully to the image of his Son. Let's look together in verses 12 to 13, our serious obligation. The opening of verse 12 helps us see that, that what Paul is about to say is an inference. It's a conclusion based on what came before. So then, Paul writes, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Okay, now why is that so then there? Well, remember what Paul had just written in verse 11. The presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in every believer guarantees our future bodily resurrection. The Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead on the third day will also raise us up from the ground one day too. And so, Paul says, all that the Spirit has done from the beginning to the end in our salvation, it creates a debt. It creates an obligation. We are debtors, Paul writes in verse 12. But the debt we owe cannot possibly be to our sinful flesh, can it? Why? Because our old man, who we used to be in Adam, was headed for death. The flesh has not done anything for us as Christians, for which we ought to say, well, thank you so much, flesh, right? And respond to it by serving the flesh with our sinful desires. It's not the flesh who will raise us up on the last day, it's the spirit. In fact, if our sinful flesh had its way, it would quite literally drag us all the way to hell, okay? So then we do not owe the flesh anything, Paul writes. When sin and temptation, friends, knock on the door of your heart, claiming that it's time for you to obey, you do not have to respond. You owe the flesh absolutely nothing. Friends, think of the temptation that think, that feels strongest in your life right now. Maybe it's temptation towards sinful anger or gossip, or complaining, or lust, or bitterness, or selfishness, or whatever it may be, as strong as the the gravitational pull you may feel in your heart toward that sin, the Word of God says your feeling is not dictated by what the actual reality is. Sin has no inherent debt claim over your life. You owe it nothing. And remember, this next time, Your sin, your temptation comes calling. That pull may seem irresistible, but you do not have to give in. You do not owe the flesh anything. And of course, what Paul doesn't say, but what I think he clearly implies by verse 12, is that that, that you as a Christian, not debtors to the flesh, are in fact, we are in fact obligated to respond to the Spirit's authority in our lives. God's work of grace creates an obligation toward him. I mean, we rehearse this in our hymns, don't we? Come thou fount, O to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. We owe nothing to the flesh. We owe everything to the spirit. He's the one who has the claim on our lives and the one who energizes us to live a life pleasing to God. 
Well, in verse 13, Paul explains a bit more of what's at stake in this whole thing. In fact, he's, he writes that the stakes could not be higher. Look at verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Friends, did you notice that baked into this verse is both a warning and a promise? Did you see that? A warning for the outcome of living a life according to the flesh and a promise for the outcome of living a life according to the Spirit. Did you see that? Of course, the death and life that Paul has in mind here is eternal death and eternal life. He's just reiterating what he wrote back in verse 6. If you let your eyes scan back up to verse 6, if what flows through the main pipeline of your spiritual life, your mindset is rebellion against God, well, then make no mistake, the end of that type of life is death and eternal condemnation. But, end of verse 13, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Whereas before Christ, when we lived in the flesh, we were at peace with our sin, weren't we? Well, now in the spirit, we're to be at war with it. Whereas when we lived in the flesh, we we gave our sin life. We fed it, right? We nurtured it. We coddled it. Well, now in the spirit, we're to put our sin to death. Friends, this is not Paul's version of leveling up in Christianity, right? This is what genuine, authentic, real Christianity looks like. Paul expects us as believers to repudiate our sin so strongly in our lives that the only image that he could come up for, come up with, excuse me, for the whole thing to do it justice is putting our sin to death. We're to give no sin, no breathing room in our hearts. In fact, we're to go to work in choking the life from it so that we kill it all together. Friends, I want us to notice a couple of things about the end of verse 13. The end of verse 13. First of all, notice that Paul refers to sin as the deeds of the body. How do we as human beings carry out our sin? Well, it's with our bodies, right? The deeds of the body is every use of our body which sinfully serves ourselves instead of God and others. It's anytime we use our eyes or our ears or our mouths or our hands or our feet or any of our faculties for the sake of sinning. Friends, I don't know about you, but I appreciate how real Paul gets here. I mean, he has talked a lot, hasn't he, in Romans 6 to 8 about our union with Christ and our victory over sin and death, that we're released from sin slavery. Even in verse 12 that we just studied, we're debtors, but not to the flesh. Yet at the very same time, friends, Paul is not presenting us here with a fantasy version of the Christian life that's all triumph and no struggle. No, he is well aware that the Christian life is not a constant bed of roses spiritually. It's not like at the moment that you and I became Christians, every sin struggle that we've ever had suddenly melted away. No, certainly the Spirit transforms our lives when He brings us to Jesus. There's no question. There is a radical transformation that takes place. But on the other hand, that transformation is not the end of our war with sin. In fact, it's just the beginning. Since I've had several conversations with new Christians in our congregation about this fact, when they've been dismayed by their continued struggle with their anger or worry or pride or whatnot. How can I be a Christian and still sin this much? Well, I've tried to encourage them that before they came to Christ, they would not have given a rip about their problem with anger or their worry or their whatever. Their conscience was not bothering them. There was no contrition. There was no repentance over sin. There was only a full-fledged contentment and pursuit of it. So friend, if you grieve your sin with godly sorrow and want it to be done with it, that is a really, really good sign, is it not? And as you grow in Christ, what's going to happen is that over time, The Spirit's conviction and His transforming work in your life is probably going to be less about the life-dominating types of sins and more about the subtle sins of attitudes and motivations and thoughts that you had never noticed before when you were less mature in Christ. The more you know Christ, the more you grow into His glory, the more you're going to see your great need of Him. 
The more you know God's holiness, the more you see your own sin with clear eyes as the the light of God's glory reflects upon who you are. Beloved, this too is a sign of grace in your life, okay? Don't gloss over the subtle sins as no big deal, but don't despair of them either. An enormous part of Christian maturity is putting to death even those more subtle sins and so that you might more accurately and faithfully reflect the image of God's dear son, Christ. Here's another thing to notice about verse 13. Who is it, according to the text, who is it that puts to death the deeds of the body? Who is responsible for it? It's you. Beloved, Paul doesn't say just let go and let God, right? He doesn't say just yield the steering wheel of your life to the Lord and let him drive the car. No, he places the responsibility on each one of us to be active, not passive in putting sin to death. Let me give you a practical for instance, okay? So if temptation typically comes to you through what you see, whether it's sexual temptation or materialism or greed or covetousness or comparison with other people, friends, you have got to be ruthless about not setting your eyes on those things. It's not legalism, for instance, beloved, to remove apps from your phone that are tripping you up spiritually or to have a dumb phone altogether. It's not being a prude, brothers, to have a personal, or sisters, really, to have a personal policy about spending time alone with the members of the opposite sex, not your spouse. It's not being out of step with society, friends, to get off social media if it's dragging your spiritual life into the grave because of the way that it feeds your self-focus. It's we who have the responsibility to bring God's word to bear on our temptations and sins. It's we who must bring our sins into the light of prayer and accountability and encouragement of fellow believers in the church who fight alongside us in this war. Friends, can you imagine what you would do if you came home one day and found out that a rattlesnake had found its way into your home and was coiled up in your living room? I mean, chills just went down like all of our spines, right? What would you do? Play with it? Give it a few pets, you know, to see how close you could come to not getting bitten? No, you would take a shovel to its head. Or if you'd like, you're like me, you would call Phil Hagel to <laughs> take a shovel to its head. Beloved, each one of us needs to see in our sin the deadly danger embodied by that snake. If we protect our sin by hiding it or giving it room to breathe, we think it's no big deal, it will kill us in the end. Friend, did you know that every sin in your life, if left to itself, would grow into the worst possible form of itself? Did you know that? If sin had its way, every lust left alone would grow fully into the sin of adultery or fornication. Every sin of unbelief would expand fully into full-on atheism if left alone. Every doubt into apostasy. Every hateful thought into murder. Beloved, this is why the Puritan pastor and theologian John Owen famously wrote in his book on this very verse called The Mortification of Sin, Be Killing Sin or It Will Be Killing You. The principle is that we stop sin in its tracks at the very first sight of it in our hearts. We, we seek to put it to death at its first appearance so that it doesn't grow to become a monster in our lives that we eventually cannot tame. And yet, notice in verse 13, that at the very same time, God enlists us for the fight of our lives. He reminds us that we wage warfare against sin, not in our own strength, but by the Spirit. So encouraging. Praise God. He did not just kind of push us into this war with sin alone. It is the Spirit of God who comes beside us to to hold up our arms, to swing the sword of God's Spirit, the Word of God. It's, It's He is the one who energizes us and reminds us of all the promises of God and the gospel of Christ that kind of defang the power of temptation. We wage the war, but we never wage it alone. God Himself takes up our cause with us. 
The final thing I want you to notice about the end of verse 13 is the promise itself. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Friends, God knows our tendency to laziness in the Christian life. He knows also how painful and how exhausting this business of killing our sin can be. And so he holds out the greatest possible motive toward the opposition of sin in our lives. He quite literally says eternal life is at stake. In other words, there is a type of life that leads to death, the life of the flesh. But there is another type of death, death to sin, that leads to life eternal. So by all means, kill your sin so that you might enter into life. Now, friends, Paul is not contradicting his emphasis throughout Romans that, psych, just kidding, right? Salvation is actually something that you earn by your works and not something that you receive by grace. Not at all. Rather, Paul is emphasizing the fact that all who are truly Christ live under his lordship. And that faith in Christ is, friends, not merely a backward-looking belief in the death of Jesus and a reliance on the cross and the resurrection. It is a forward-looking belief to all the promises of God in Christ. It's not only being sure of what Jesus did, it's being confident and satisfied in what Jesus will do. So that putting your hope in God's promise of eternal life, what it does, it begins to, to strip that sugar coating off the poison of our sin. It goes something like this. Oh, the temptation feels really strong and really appetizing right now. But I know what God has prepared for me is so much better. Sin promises to make my future happier, but I know that only God can do that. Sin is lying to me. What happens is that faith in God's promise begins to overcome the lies of sin. One of the ways sin loses its grip on our souls is, is that when we recognize how awful sin's consequences are, both temporary in the here and now and eternal, sin destroys. It takes far more from us than we ever intended to give it. And yet at the same time, Paul does not just motivate us negatively. He gives us a positive vision of what awaits us when the fight is over. What is that promised hope? It is eternal life. It is eternal life that strengthens us to wage war against our sin. Beloved, well, what Paul is saying in so many words is it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. So don't give up, right? Don't throw in the towel because sin lingers in your life. The Spirit of God is with you if you're trusting in Christ to save you. So if you dropped your sword, you've given up, you've just walked off the battlefield in shame, turn around and walk back on. Remember that Christ has forgiven every sin of your past, present, and future. In fact, friend, the, the, the sin that you so fiercely fight in your life is an already conquered foe. So pick up your sword again and start swinging. Keep doing it until your faith turns to sight. This is our serious obligation. Number two, our incredible privilege. Friends, what Paul does in the rest of this section is explain, uh, explain the nature of our warfare against sin by helping us to understand who we are in relation to God. And what he ends up saying is that we as Christians, again, don't merely fight as soldiers listed in the king's army. He uses that metaphor from time to time. That's not what he says here. We're not contracted mercenaries with no relationship to God. No, in fact, it's just the opposite. What Paul says in verses 14 to 17 is absolutely staggering. We wage war on sin as beloved sons and daughters. Look at verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Why is it that those who put sin to death by the Spirit receive eternal life in the end? Because those who are led by the Spirit, Paul writes, those who are under His governing authority, those who submit to the Spirit's leadership, not merely servants of God, they're not merely workers for God or anything like that. Incredibly, those led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Now, what I think Paul means to happen at this point is for the jaw of the Roman believers reading this letter originally to hit the floor 
in astonishment. I certainly think that should be our reaction to this morning. Friends, Israel, in the Old Testament, Israel as a whole was called the Son of God. We read a text today in Jeremiah 31 where that was the case. But now in Christ, both Jew and Gentile believers are welcomed into the family of God. And sisters, lest you freak out that Paul is some, you know, misogynist and excluding you from this relationship, he will actually call us children in verse 16. He's not singling out men here more than he is women. The reason that he, that he calls those led by the Spirit the sons of God is because of this adoption and inheritance metaphor that he's about to, to use in verses 15 to 16. So hold that thought. We'll get there in a second. In Roman culture, friends, it was the son. It was the son that typically came into the inheritance. Paul is preparing us to understand the full ramification of what being a child of God looks like by calling us his sons. Look at verse 15. Paul explains a little bit more what he means by this relationship. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. In other words, life in the spirit is something entirely different than life in the flesh. Some, something entirely different and something entirely better than living under the law and the power of sin. Friends, Paul's saying, listen, Christ did not deliver you from the penalty of your sin only to, to place you back in the same type of slavery that you once were in. Now that you're living in the realm or the kingdom of the Spirit, you don't have to live fearful that if you don't earn your keep, God's going to condemn you in the end. Am I good enough? Right? Does he really love me? Does, can I really trust him? I mean, I had a really bad day. Not at all. The Christian life is not this constant loop of fear about Jesus' posture toward us when we mess up. We didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Friends, as a Christian, you don't have to be terrified that you're not doing enough or being sincere enough or not being holy enough. Friend, that is nothing like what Paul describes this relationship. Instead, Paul says in verse 15, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. Friends, it's at this point as a preacher that I, become, that I become nervous that nothing I can say from here on out will adequately capture how glorious and incredible this privilege is that Paul says each believer in Christ has. Just consider the change in status that has to take place for you and I to be considered the adopted sons of God. None of us are natural born into God's family. In our sin, we were all rebels against God. We were born in Adam in sin. We were estranged from him. We were his enemies. We were slaves to our sin. In fact, did you know when the New Testament describes us in our life without God, it does not describe us as sons of God but as sons of disobedience, Ephesians 2, 2. That we by nature were children of wrath, Ephesians 2, 3. Friends, in our sin, we had no relationship with God as Father, none. We only stood guilty before Him as our judge. Friends, God would have been entirely just. The universe would have risen up and praised him if he just decided to, to leave us alone and consign each one of us to an eternity of condemnation. But that is not how he chose to deal with us. Not only did he make a way for us to be right with him, not only did he send his son to redeem us and reconcile us and justify us. Friends, if all our salvation was, was a new verdict hanging over our lives, that would have been awesome enough right? We would have praised God for all eternity for declaring us righteous. We would have worshiped the Lord Jesus forever for forging our peace with God and bringing us into his kingdom. That would have been plenty enough to, war to warrant our praise and our worship. But God did not stop there. He went above and beyond. In his great mercy, our judge became our father. The doctrine of justification means that you're exonerated and forgiven in God's courtroom through Jesus taking your judgment for you. That's glorious enough. But friends, adoption means that you are welcomed 
into God's living room as a woman. You are a beloved son and daughter of the king. This is why J.I. Packer in his amazing chapter on sonship in his book, Knowing God, calls adoption the highest privilege in the gospel. That to, to be right with God the judge is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God the Father is far greater. Friends, this knowledge ought to overwhelm our hearts with awe and gratitude this morning. That's why John in 1 John 3, 1 says, see what type of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. It's simply incredible. It's mind-blowing. We who are slaves of sin have now become sons and daughters by grace with all the enduring affection and love and intimacy that a father-child relationship implies. Friends, I want us to think a bit more about this term adoption and why Paul calls the spirit, the spirit of adoption. Friends, even in our modern society, adoption is the legal process where a child becomes the son or daughter of parents uh, who were not the parents naturally or biologically. Adoption involves transferring all the parental rights and responsibilities from the biological parents or guardians to the adoptive parents. It's that way in our culture, and it was that way in Roman culture. Only in Roman culture, it wasn't usually young children who were adopted, but adult males who were chosen by the adoptive father to perpetuate his family name and his estate, his inheritance. And yet, in both our culture and in ancient Rome, when a child becomes the son or daughter of new parents through adoption, friends, he or she is not inferior in status in any way from those biological sons and daughters. To be an adopted son is to be a real son. To be adopted is to enjoy the affection and love of the parents just as if one was born into that family. Friends, adopted children are not children by right or by blood, but through an act of grace and kindness. Friends, this grace is infinitely magnified when we talk about our own adoption into the family of God. Because listen, you and I, we are not sons and daughters by right. You understand that? I know it's common to refer to all humanity as God's children, right? God's the universal father. And yes, human beings are God's offspring by creation. But friends, the type of sonship that the New Testament has in mind here is a sonship exclusively for those who are rescued from the penalty of their sin by the grace and mercy of God. So John wrote in John 1.12, but to all who did receive Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, become the children of God is not something that we're born into. It's something that we're born again into. It's a byproduct of all that God has done in Christ to save us. Friends, you know, right, that there is only one Son of God by virtue of who He is and what He's done. Just one. There's only one, of son, of, there's only one son of God by right, and that's the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has already flagged this for us in verse 3 when he talked about the Father sending the Son for our salvation. In fact... The only way that this adopted sonship can be transferred to us as believers is by virtue of what we've been talking about over the past several weeks with our union with Christ. It's this incredible reality that in our salvation, what is true of Christ becomes true of us. And we're like branches that have been kind of grafted into the trunk of Jesus. The now what's Jesus' is by right becomes ours by grace. Jesus is the divine son from all eternity. He became the incarnate son to redeem us. And because you and I are united by faith to Christ, that status of sonship that is his by right becomes ours by the mercy of God. That's what Paul is getting at in verse 17 when he writes that we are heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ, with Christ. That is union with Christ, union with him. All that God gives to his son he now gives to us. I mean, it's a simple statement. It took me like three seconds to say it, 
It's explosive in its reality. All that God gives to the Son, He gives to us. Jesus, friends, is the true offspring of Abraham. And what God promised the offspring of Abraham in the Old Testament wasn't just a promised land in Palestine, but nothing less than the whole world. Remember, we studied that last year in Romans 4.13. Abraham is the heir of the world. Jesus is the true son of Abraham. Because you and I have been brought into the same status of sonship that Jesus has, the inheritance that he won, he now shares with all of us as his people. We too are inheritors of the world. A day is coming when we will live in a new creation free of sin and suffering. We are co-heirs with Jesus of an eternal resurrected existence. Just mind-blowing in its awesomeness. Consider this as well. Because Jesus' status as the beloved son cannot possibly be reversed, friends, neither can your status as God's sons and daughters. God loves you with an irreversible, enduring, intimate love. The same bonds of love that hold together the Father and the Son through the Spirit have now bound you to the heart of the Father. God loves you like He loves His Son. And Paul writes that the Holy Spirit makes that love come alive in your heart. He makes it real. He makes you experience it. That's why Paul calls the Spirit the Spirit of adoption. One of the main tasks of the Holy Spirit in the life of every single believer is to make us realize with increasing clarity the meaning and depth and realness of that relationship with God our Father through the Son. That's why Paul says in verse 15, we've received the Spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Friends, the word Abba was no more part of the Romans language than it is ours. You might look at that and say, what in the world does that mean? Actually, it's not even a Greek word in the original New Testament. It's an Aramaic word. It's an intimacy term for one's father. Daddy is a little too casual, I think. Some have said it just means daddy. That's, that's a little too casual, lacks some of the necessary reverence, but it's probably not all that far off. Something like dear father is closer to what Abba means. You say, well, John, well, why did... Paul used this weird Aramaic word to describe the cry of our hearts toward God as our Father. Because, friends, this is the word that Jesus used when he cried out to his Father in the moment of his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, went to the garden to pray after supper. And what did he pray? Abba. Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Friends, do you see what this verse in Romans 8 is saying? In his grace, God doesn't just transfer you into the realm of the spirit. He doesn't just give the spirit to indwell us and help us fight the fight against sin. No, it's something far more profound than that. What the Holy Spirit does is to help you and I as blood-bought believers realize and experience the intimacy that Jesus himself enjoys with the Father. The Abba that Jesus cries to the Father is his by right. But friends, you have the full ability to cry that same cry right now by his grace. The Father is no less our Abba, then he is the Abba of his beloved son. Yesterday, my family and I spent most of the day at the Goodyear Little League opening day events and, uh, in, you know, included inflatables and bouncy houses and raffles and all the rest. Uh, Canaan, I feel like I use him as an illustration every week. I'm sorry. That's just vivid in my life right now. Um, Canaan and I were standing in line uh, for one of those inflatables. And at one point, for no specific reason other than I just simply love this kid, I just scooped him up in my arms as we're standing there in line. I turned him sideways, and I just began kissing his neck. And, of course, he's giggling and laughing and squealing and all the rest. Having, we're having a great old time together. Friends, I would do that with each one of my kids if they were still that little. I cannot pick the older two up now nearly as easily, but I try to remind them regularly how much I love them. 
and show them that. Now, friends, let me ask you, was Canaan any less my son when he was on the ground next to me than when he was in my arms when I was kissing him? No, of course not. Of course not. But when I picked him up spontaneously in that embrace of affection, oh, I hope he vibrantly experienced his sonship. This is what the ministry of the Spirit is like in your life as a believer. Look at verse 16. The Spirit himself, not just a force, it's not just an energy field. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The point is not that the Spirit makes you the children of God per se, it's that he makes us aware that you're children of God. How is it that you can cry out to God, friend, confident that he's your father? Well, friend, it's not that you testify in and through your own spirit and just hope for the best. No. Praise be to God. There is a far more powerful witness who testifies with you and to you about whose you are. It's the spirit of God himself who confirms your status as a child of God in your own soul. He applies the work of Christ in your spiritual life. So beloved, when you pray to the Lord as your father, when you cast your cares on him, knowing that he cares for you, when you renew your soul in his love, this experience is yours because of the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of adoption crying out in your soul. When you fight your sin with the knowledge that you're a child of God and you just want more than anything to honor your father and stay as close as you can to him, it's the spirit who is reminding you of that relationship. He bears witness with your spirit that you belong to the father and that the father loves you more than you can imagine. Finally, look at what Paul says about our adoption and the ministry of the spirit in verse 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. Now, friends, we're going to talk more about what this last phrase means in a couple of weeks when we return to Romans 8, okay? The condition to receiving our full inheritance and glory is that we suffer with Christ. Our union with him means that the pattern of Christ's career, well, that's the pattern of our career, of our life, suffering and then glory, the cross and then the crown. But for now, look at this last blessing of sonship that Paul parades before our view. The Spirit bears witness not merely that we're God's children, but his heirs, fellow heirs with Christ. Friends, the greatest gift of our adopted sonship is not that God has merely prepared us for glory. It's not that we're going to inherit the world. It's that he's given us himself. We're heirs of God. We receive him. I hope it's evident now why Paul gave us all this glorious theology. Friends, it's meant to serve a very practical purpose, isn't it? In In the context of these verses, verses 12 to 17. Let's put it all together. How is it that the Spirit guards us from those fake promises of love and satisfaction that sin offers you? Well, he reminds us that we've already received the deepest, most satisfying, and truest love that we could ever receive. God is our Father, and we are his children. How does the Spirit deaden the allure of sin? He does so with the superior pleasure and power of God's grace in our relationship with God. We have all that we could ever want or ever need because we're heirs of God. How or what, I should say, what could possibly motivate us to wage war on our sin? Well, how about the experience of God as our father? We just can't stomach the thought of grieving him or losing the fellowship that we enjoy with him as virtue of our adoption. What is the truth that's going to fuel the boldness and honesty that we need to repent of our sin when we stumble and fall? Well, surely that boldness, that honesty is fueled by the knowledge that our status as sons of God does not change. The Father welcomes us 
back into his arms. So we repent boldly. Here's what the Christian life looks like. Sons and daughters of God, waging fierce warfare against sin. Oh, friends, may the Lord remind us of this grace in our fight, even this week. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you might remind us even this morning of the magnitude of your great love for us. And Father, we want to go deeper to know more of it, to experience more of the reality that Christ has won for us and the Spirit makes real in our lives. Oh Lord, forgive us for so often being casual, not only about our sin, but casual about our relationship with you, taking it for granted. Oh, Father, I pray that if anything, this morning would have just been a fresh awakening for us as your people to the unbelievable privilege we have to be called the sons and daughters of the King. Oh, Father, may we live our lives in that reality. Oh, Father, may we stay close to you in fellowship with you. Oh, Father, may we come boldly before your throne in prayer. Help us to not practically ignore our relationship with you by our prayerlessness. Oh Lord, and when it comes to our fight against sin, may all that we have learned today about our status fuel the type of grace, grace-filled fighting that you commend through your word. Oh Father, may we not relax and be lazy in our Christian life. Oh Father, motivate us, spur us on, by the knowledge of your love. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.